The history of race and Britain is a long, complicated and contentious one. In this episode of the Present History Podcast, we're going to take a deep but brief dive into this history and how it directly affects us today, taking a particular focus on the treatment of black people in this country. In light of all that has happened recently in America with the murder of George Floyd and the overwhelming response to it, I know that I've found myself finding it very easy to talk about racism in America. The history of it, I can you know, name the major figures, talk about the events, talk about MLK and Malcolm X or the Civil Rights Act of 1968 and everything that happened with that, but I personally know that I have very little knowledge of the history of race, racism and race relations in Britain. So this whole episode has kind of come out of my own personal research as I've tried to understand the history of this issue in our own country. So, let's dive into a brief history of being black and British. We can begin in Roman Britain. Evidence has been found of people of African ancestry being present in Britain during the Roman occupation. And these weren't just people who had been shipped over by the Romans. Bone isotopes and DNA suggest that one man found had actually grown up in the London area. And unfortunately, here is where we also see one of the first recorded incidents of racism in Britain. According to the Historia Augusta, the Emperor Septimus Severus had an Ethiopian soldier removed from his station on Hadrian's Wall because he was afraid of the ominous colour of the man's skin. This kind of evidence is similar to what we see during the Anglo-Saxon era, with a body being discovered in 2013 of a sub-Saharan African woman, dating from between 896 and 1025 AD. Jumping forward a few hundred years into the 16th century, we meet John Blanca, a black trumpeter involved in the courts of both Henry VII and Henry VIII. It was also around this time that we first hear of Britain's involvement in the slave trade. John Locke, in 1555, is recorded to have brought captives from Guinea into London. What is interesting, however, is that as the war against Spain during 1588 and 1604 progressed, the number of slaves arriving in Britain from Spanish colonial expeditions in Africa increased. But this is not for the reason you might think. The English actually freed many of these captives from Spanish enslavement, with them becoming interpreters or sailors in their own right. And yet this does little to balance Britain's involvement in the slave trade. One of the first recorded British slave traders is John Hawkins, who brought 300 West African captives to London in the late 1500s. During Elizabeth I's reign, the black population of Britain, while growing, was also being actively discouraged. Here we see the ugly head of racism reared once more. A man named George Best argued in 1578 that black skin was not the result of the heat of the African sun, but of biblical damnation. This is a trend that continued, with darker skin being linked to witchcraft, demons, and even the devil himself in quick succession. This was a belief that penetrated British society, with black people being seen as fundamentally different and incompatible with the Britain they lived in. The slave trade, however, did not really take hold in Britain until the 17th century, when we became involved in the tri-continental slave trade between Europe, America and Africa. During the next two centuries, the involvement of Britain in the global slave trade grew, as did its black population. Soon, black communities in places like Liverpool and Bristol flourished. At this time, the late 1700s, the black population of Britain constituted a mere 1% of the overall population. The majority of black people in this country during that time 
were employed as servants in the hierarchies of British aristocracy, with a reported 20,000 black servants in 1764. Officially, slavery was never legal in England, but when has an official declaration ever accurately represented the truth of the matter? African slaves continued to be bought and sold throughout the 18th century. And yet, in the midst of all of this, we still see black people rising up over the oppression to achieve incredible things. Ignatius Sancho was the first black person of African origins to vote in parliamentary elections and became a symbol of the humanity of Africans and the immorality of the slave trade. Olorda Equiano became the first black person to be employed by the British government when he was made commissary of provisions and stores for the 350 black people suffering from poverty who had decided to accept the government's offer of an assisted passage to Sierra Leone. But, as always, something arises to set back the progression and reveal the true nature of racism in Britain during this time. When Dadabai Nairoji, an Indian Briton, was defeated in a parliamentary election in 1886, Lord Salisbury remarked that, however great the progress of mankind has been, and however far we have advanced in overcoming prejudices, I doubt if we have yet got to the point of view where a British constituency would elect a black man. In the late 18th century, the British slave trade began to decline, as the public turned against it. The Atlantic slave trade was abolished in 1808, and slavery was completely abolished in the British Empire by 1834. The 19th century sees a decrease in reports of black communities growing, with the majority of the British black population being male. By the late 19th century, race discrimination was beginning to be built on theories of scientific racism, which argued that whites were superior and that blacks were less intelligent than whites. Attempts to support these theories cited scientific evidence, such as brain size. James Hunt, president of the London Anthropological Society in 1863, wrote, The Negro is inferior intellectually to the European and can only be humanized and civilized by Europeans. Despite this widespread discrimination and prejudice, some black Britons managed to achieve some exceptional success. People like Pablo Fank, who rose to become the proprietor of one of Britain's most successful Victorian circuses. Now we come to one of the most catastrophic events in British history, the First World War. When the war broke out in 1914, there was a small growth in the black population with the arrival of merchant seamen and soldiers. During the war, a number of black men volunteered to serve their country, men like Walter Tull, a professional footballer. Tull played for Clapton FC, Tottenham Hotspur and Northampton Town during his career. He became the first black officer in the British Army, despite the 1914 Manual of Military Law specifically excluding soldiers that were not of pure European descent from becoming commissioned officers. He served with distinction, being put forward for a military cross, a recommendation the Ministry of Defence say they have no record of. After many records were destroyed in a fire, in 1940. Tull had signed for Rangers in 1917 while an officer cadet in Scotland and would have made his debut after the war. Unfortunately, he was killed on March the 25th, 1918. There were a number of predominantly black regiments that served on the front lines, like the British West Indies Regiment who served at the Somme. As the war came to a close in 1918, racial tensions increased as Britain tried to reintegrate veterans into the workforces again, and groups began to compete for jobs and housing. There were a number of race riots in 1919, especially targeting the Arab and Asian members of the British population. As the years rolled on, and Europe descended once more into World War in 1939, the black community saw a period of significant growth. Students, merchant seamen, servicemen and workers arrived from the Caribbean and West Africa as the war broke out. Hundreds of thousands of African 
Caribbean and Asian soldiers served for Britain during the war, most of whom were paid significantly less than their white counterparts. This underpayment was almost systematic, with white people living in African colonies and serving alongside African soldiers in colonial units always being paid more than their black counterparts. However, in the midst of all of this, we can see that back home, Britain was making very, very slow and very, very small steps towards greater racial equality. When Leary Constantine, a West Indian cricketer and welfare officer for the Ministry of Labour, was refused service at a London hotel, he sued for breach of contract and was awarded damages. Despite the action showing the depth of racism in British society, it also shows how there was a very slow growth towards legal acceptance and greater equality in legal issues. After the war ended in 1945, the largest influx of black migrants occurred. In less than a decade, over a quarter of a million West Indians settled in Britain. Here is where we first encounter the label Windrush. Named after the HMT Empire Windrush, a ship that carried the first major group of Caribbean migrants to the United Kingdom in 1948. The 1948 British Nationality Act allowed this mass migration with very few checks and with very little official paperwork. This led to most of the people working or studying over the next few years without any official documentary record of their having done so. These people were therefore wrongly detained, deported, or denied legal rights as time went on. They were not eligible for council housing, having not been in the country for more than five years, and the majority of rooms or apartments to let refused them on account of their skin. There were no anti-discrimination laws at the time, meaning that segregation became widespread and prevalent. In fact, a survey from Birmingham in 1956 found that only 15 out of a thousand white people surveyed would let a room to a black tenant. And even those that would let black people a room or house would charge them twice the rent of white tenants. This forced many black immigrants into slums and ghettos where housing was poor and the streets were rampant with crime, violence and prostitution. As the 60s went on and the 70s dawned, there was a rise in racist violence towards the black population, with the largest perpetrator being the far-right group the National Front that was founded in 1967. It was common to experience racism and segregation in Britain. Signs saying, no blacks, no dogs, no Irish, were readily hung on windows and doors to perpetuate the segregation and enforce separation. During this time, however, with the rise of racial intolerance and the rise of the black power movement abroad, the term black became removed from its negative connotations, being reclaimed as a marker of pride. Black is beautiful. And to combat the segregation in housing and the commonplace rejection of black people for tenancy, the Race Relations Act was introduced in 1968. This made it illegal to refuse housing, employment or public services to a person on the grounds of colour, race, ethnic or national origins. In the early 1980s, societal racism, discrimination, poverty and oppressive policing became the spark for a number of race riots in areas with large African Caribbean populations. St Paul's in 1980, Brixton, Toxteth and Moss Side in 1981, St Paul's again in 1982, Notting Hill Gate in 1982, Toxteth in 1982, and Handsworth, Brixton, and Tottenham in 1985. These were large-scale riots, leading to many people on both sides being injured, cars and shops set on fire, and hundreds of arrests being made. This was a time eerily reminiscent of the situation we now find ourselves in, in 1985, for example, protests at local police stations against the police shooting of Cherry Gross in Brixton and the death of Cynthia Jarrett after a police raid on her home in Tottenham turned violent and street battles erupted, leading to two fatalities. From here, it didn't take long for the violence to continue and tragedy 
to strike. On the 22nd of April 1993, 18-year-old Stephen Lawrence was murdered by a group of six young white men in a racially motivated attack, stabbed multiple times. This was only 27 years ago, and he wasn't the first, and he hasn't been the last. Anthony Walker, aged 18, was murdered on the 30th of July 2005. Christopher Alan Aim was murdered on the 21st of April 2006, also aged 18, both of which were racially motivated. In the wake of Stephen Lawrence's murder and the inquiry into the police's handling of it, Commissioner Sir Paul Condon accepted that the Metropolitan Police was institutionally racist. Much like the 1980s, numerous race riots broke out. 2001, in Leeds, sparked over a wrongful arrest. More than 100 Asian, white and black youths were involved in a six-hour-long riot against the police. 2005, in Birmingham, riots broke out between Caribbean and Asian communities after a group of Asian men allegedly raped a black teenage girl. Then, in 2011... Mark Duggan, a mixed-race man, was shot and killed by police in Tottenham, sparking a protest at the local police station. This descended into violence, leading to shops and flats being burned and destroyed in multiple cities across England. Research suggests that race relations in Britain deteriorated in the period following these riots, and that prejudice towards ethnic minorities actually increased. And that brings us up to today. From the 28th of May 2020, protests have been organised across Britain and Europe in response to the murder of George Floyd on the 25th of May 2020 in America. And yet, they have also been the culmination of racism in Britain, being protests against police injustice, police brutality and systemic racism in this country too. Statues have been removed, clashes and violence has occurred, and we have been part of the largest and most widespread civil rights movement in history. It is a time to remember, a time to acknowledge, educate and learn, a time of grief and a time of hope, a time to work and a time to fight, a time for unity and a time to listen. So how does this history affect us today? How is it relevant and what does it mean for us now. First off, the obvious answer is that it shows the depth and extent of racism in this country. Racism has been present in Britain since the Roman era, and it has always been an issue and continues to be one. Without understanding this history, one will never truly understand what the black community have experienced for their entire history. One will never know why or understand the reasoning behind protests over here. An American incident may have been the spark, but the embers were profoundly British. To move forward, we must understand what has brought us here. To search for a solution, we have to learn what we've tried before, what has worked, and what has not. The past can either hold us back or become the propellant for a brighter future. We can either be dragged down by the past or build upon it to form a future we may just be proud of. I hope this has been helpful. I hope that this has empowered you to have better conversations or equipped you to try and work for a solution from a position of greater understanding and knowledge. My one request from this podcast is that you don't leave it here. This is by no means an authoritative history. Please read more books, study more, listen more. Use this as a start, a beginning, a foundation. But please don't leave it here. Thank you very much for listening and I'll see you on the next episode of the Present History Podcast.